Welcome to Security Architecture Podcast, where we help cybersecurity professionals to stay ahead of the curve and ensure they are successful in their cybersecurity journey. Hi, I'm Evgeny. Hi, I'm Dimitri. We have here Jason from Upgate. Jason, can you please introduce yourself and the company? Yes, thank you, Evgeny and Dimitri. It's great to be here on this podcast. My name is Jason Garbus. I am Senior Vice President of Products at AppGate. Um, and in this role, I'm responsible for our secure remote access and zero trust product direction uh, strategy. I work very closely with industry analysts and customers. Uh, and AppGate as a company is a security and technology company providing secure zero trust solutions for enterprises. What is the name of the product that's addressing the ZTNA remote access? Yep. The product that we're talking about is called AppGate SDP. And as the name implies, it implements uh, the software defined perimeter architecture, which is an open security architecture from the Cloud Security Alliance. We would like to jump and understand your architecture. So if you maybe share your screen, show us diagrams, we really want to know how the high availability is working, how people connect, where's the connect, if the traffic is routed inside your backbone, outside, or anything else is you think it's important for people to understand how you are connected? Sure thing. Uh, so I'm sharing the screen here, and I got a couple of slides. So the uh, first thing to understand is that the way the product works and the way the product architecture is set up um, is really oriented around providing customers with choice. Uh, we believe that as a set of distributed components, if we use our zero trust terminology, a set of distributed policy decision points and policy enforcement points, that it's really important for customers to be able to decide where and how this traffic is routed, where and how to place these enforcement points uh, as close as possible to the resources that they're protecting. So in some cases, organizations wanna have complete control of all the traffic in other cases, they're okay with it routing up through a so cloud environment or a vendor cloud environment. So it, you know, our philosophy on this is really about providing customers with, with the most choice possible. Um, another thing that you'll see, I think, through the discussion is that we really believe and in the zero trust principles of securing all access for all users to all resources. And therefore, we think it we shouldn't think about things as how do we provide secure remote access for users? Because especially in today's day and age with so much of our user population working from home is that remote access is just access. And that really is a fundamental shift in how we think security leaders should think about approaching this, which is it's not remote access because my users are all over the place and my resources are all over the place. I need an access solution that works uniformly and simplifies my environment. That was a little bit of a setup. Let's talk about the architecture to, to make it concrete. So the first piece to understand is um, there are three main components that we, we have in the architecture. Uh, the first one is called the controller and that acts as a centralized authentication point and policy store. Uh, and the second is a set of network gateways that run inline and sit in front of the resources that they're protecting. And if you're familiar with the zero trust terminology, the controller acts as a policy decision point and the gateways act as policy enforcement points. There's also a piece of software that runs on a user's device called a client. Uh, and the combination of these things makes for some really interesting and powerful secure access approaches. First thing to understand is <clears throat> as part of the, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of the SDP specification um, and something that we believe is really, really important is that the gateways and the controllers on the network, because they need to be accessible to any user who's remote, they need to be visible on the internet. They need to have <clears throat> public IP addresses, but we firmly believe that um, they need to be cloaked and hidden from unauthorized users. So we utilize a mechanism that's part, again, of the software defined perimeter specification called single packet authorization. What single packet authorization does is it allows those controllers and gateways to be unresponsive to unauthorized users. So they don't have an open port. You can't send a TCP SYN to it and get a SYN act back and establish a TCP connection. And this immediately significantly reduces the attack surface and is a significant improvement differentiator over traditional VPN concentrators or other types of remote access solutions where we're exposing them to all these advanced attackers and nation states. Uh, and we've seen some terrible vulnerabilities that have happened over the past year in widely, widely deployed commercial VPNs uh, and other remote access solutions. 
the single packet authorization mechanism utilizes a simple component of, uh, based on simple cryptography, uh, based on a shared secret to generate a time-based, uh, basically a one-time password that's embedded in the very first network packet that's sent to the controller from the user's device. So the process is the user will turn on their device or decide to launch the Yathgate STP client. The client will <clears throat> utilize uh, this seed that they have to generate the appropriate one-time password and embed it in the first network packet that's sent from the client to the controller. That will tell the controller who can then validate this packet with very, very low computational overhead that, hey, this is a valid client. They have the proper seed. I'm gonna actually allow them to go to the next step which is establish a TCP connection, and then to establish a mutually authenticated TLS connection with each of the sides validating one another's certificate to make sure that's valid. Once that happens, then the user is actually authenticated through the controller to the identity provider of choice in the enterprise. That all takes you know, three or four seconds. Jason, quick, quick question. The connection from the client to the controller, is this a TLS, uh, some other protocol? Uh, it uses mutual TLS, um, and it can be supported over uh, TCP or over UDP. So it would be DTLS in that case. How often the seed is uh, changing? The seed changes um, as frequently or as infrequently as customers want. Uh, the important thing to understand is that's only the first step in the process, right? The seed doesn't unlock everything. All the seed does is allows you to establish a TCP connection and then you go for further steps of validating the certificate and validating the user. And let's assume I'm in Starbucks coffee shop and I'm sending from there the seed. It doesn't mean that uh, everyone that's coming out from this public IP also will be able to, to actually access and send network uh, packets to the controller? Yes, exactly. So what of course the controller, it looks at the NATed public IP address uh, where that packet is coming from. So it opens up <clears throat> the ability for you're correct, any client from that public IP address to establish a TCP connection to the controller for a limited period of time, about 30 seconds. So it's a very small window. And again, this is the, you know, the first layer of defense among seven or eight. Uh, so once that happens, of course, then a client establishes a TCP connection, which then lets them establish a mutually authenticated TLS connection. So there's, ma there's many layers of security in there. So once that happens and the user is authenticated through the controller to the identity provider, then the controller pulls together and consolidates a, a rich set of contextual information about the user from the identity provider, from the user's device, and from any other set of resources that the enterprise has chosen uh, to use from the controller. They can make a call out to an endpoint management system, for example, or to a SIM system. All of that context is then used to evaluate the set of policies that the user can have uh, access to and the controller will then make a determination as to which set of network resources the user is entitled to get to at this point in time. It packages that information up in what we call live entitlements, which is a piece of data that is sent down to the client's device. The client then takes that data and uses it to establish secure MTLS connections to the appropriate set of gateways in their environment. Now this picture shows a single gateway and of course, real environments will have multiple distributed sets of gateways. The client goes through the same process of using a single packet authorization token and MTLS. Then what it does is it hands those live entitlements up to the gateway. The gateway does further evaluation and validation of those, and then makes a determination as to which actual resources in that user's environment that sit behind the gateway, the user is permitted to get access to at this point in time. And it sets up a logical, logical connection from the user's device through the gateway and then to the target application based on application information and metadata. And of course, based on the type of protocol and port that is uh, associated with that, uh, that entitlement. So once that happens, which you'll see the demo takes five or six seconds, then the user has a network pathway, network route for the traffic to get to those target resources. And then the user can just be productive and do their work and they can launch their browser or their RDP client or whatever tools or, or network Jason, protocols are using. Yes. Is the connection happening from the client to the gateway directly? Because the gateway is behind the NAT, behind the firewall. Uh, the, the connection is happening directly from the client to the gateway. So the gateway, like the controller, has a public IP address exposed to the internet so that re users can access it from wherever they need to. And who operates the gateway? Customers will operate that. So, so it's running on the customer environment, whether it's on cloud or on-prem. That's right, that's right. Customers can choose to deploy those gateways wherever they want. 
and uh, what kind of ports been exposed by this gateway? What kind of requirements? Uh, everything goes over 443 TLS, exactly. Yeah, or GTLS, exactly. Uh, finally, the system itself is very dynamic. So the live entitlements token has a limited lifespan, uh, typically of two to three hours. And the system itself supports a number of APIs for um, updating a user's entitlement. The gateway itself also has built-in capabilities, as we'll see later, uh, to interrogate its target environment and actually dynamically change what a user has access to based on uh, metadata changes for uh, for those target applications. Well, that's a very simple overview of how it works. How um, often the uh, gateway uh, communicates with the controller? Uh, gateway has a, a persistent connection to persistent. the controller. Yeah. So any change that happens on the controller it immediately propagates to the gateway. Exactly. One more diagram to show a more realistic environment and some of the capabilities and benefits of this architecture, which is you can see here that in this example, the enterprise has four different protected environments and they each have a clustered pair of gateways uh, that sit in front of them to protect it. Um, the one on the lower left happens to be a controller and a gateway and the other ones would just be gateways. From the user's perspective, this is transparent. Uh, they don't really know where these resources are. They just know that they can be productive and get access to them. And there's actually four concurrent MTLS connections that are shown here that are set up in parallel. Uh, so there's no, th this compares very favorably to a traditional VPN, which enforces a single entry point and then some sort of MPLS uh, or wide area network backbone uh, in the enterprise. This allows organizations to do this in a much more natural way that works really well with the type of distributed and heterogeneous environments and systems that they have. So I have a question about that. So the connection to the final application maintained by the gateway, right? And it's the gateway terminates the connection between the client and the gateway. Is, is that how it works? Yes, that's right. The traffic is tunneled through this MTLS connection to the gateway. And then the gateway will take the, the, the traffic out of the tunnel and send it to its target destination to the application using that application's native protocol inside of that environment. So that environment, if you're, if you look at the zero trust language, that's what's called the implicit trust zone because it's behind the gateway and traffic can only get to it through the gateway if it's enforced by a policy. Okay, um, so that's the um, kind of that's the architecture. And one of the things that we know sometimes folks ask about is, okay, you know, tell us about your environment, how many pops are there? And you know, we believe that the real question is how many policy enforcement points or PEPs do you have, right? Where are the gateways? And the answer is that customers decide where and how to place those gateways, whether it's in a virtual private cloud that they operate in on top of an IAS environment or in a physical environment that they have. And this type of architecture lets customers choose where and how the traffic is, is routed and where it goes. And if you know, you've got a, an on-premises environment like shown there on the right-hand side and it's in you know, your London office, it, it really doesn't matter you know, what the intermediate traffic is, whether it goes through a cloud provider or some backbone uh, or just across the plain vanilla internet, you know, it still needs to go through that policy enforcement point uh, and to that destination in London. Would the customer use you to access SaaS applications? Yeah, they absolutely can. Uh, and we do have customers doing that to, do get, to get some benefits from that. Now, of course, SaaS applications are a little bit of a different beast in that the SaaS providers have their own defenses against DDoS attacks. And of course, all that traffic occurs natively over HTTPS, so it's already encrypted. The value that this type of solution can provide for SaaS applications is number one, um, that access is tied to an organization's identity management processes. So, so if you offboard a user or if you onboard a user and you put them in the right group, they'll automatically get access to that. Uh, and they also have the ability to enforce this kind of device posture check and other type of context sensitive access controls that uh, that you can't do natively when accessing the SaaS application. How do you license this uh, solution to your customers? So our, our solution is licensed on a subscription basis uh, per user. Um, and the philosophy behind that is that we don't charge extra for the number of devices that a user has. We don't charge extra for the number of applications or for <clears throat> how many clusters of gateways uh, that they, how many gateways they've chosen to deploy in a cluster. We encourage our customers to use this type of solution for all their users and for all their applications and to encourage best, best practices like deploying multiple gateways. And the, about the gateways, there is no any license for the gateway I would deploy, except of course the cost of the compute. Right, right. Uh, and the gateways are 
generally deployed by customers actually as virtual appliances, whether in their in cloud environments or on-prem environments. Um, we have a minority of customers who choose to deploy them on traditional hardware. And you, you need the Linux operating system for it, or it's kind of appliance? It's, it's, it's fully self-contained. So we provide a full stack operating system. It's specially hardened and packaged up so that there's no provisioning or maintenance required by customers. So the customer just brings the hardware and you give them the image and they run it on this hardware. Uh, they can buy, they can license hardware through us if they chose. Most of the time, they would deploy it on top of a hypervisor or obviously in a cloud environment. It's just a just a self contained virtual machine. Can you tell us more about how you tie to MFA single sign on an identity? Sure thing. Um, so we provide and we support integration with a very wide variety of identity providers, uh, whether it's SAML based or LDAP or RADIUS type of providers. We embrace the fact that organizations have invested a lot in their identity providers. And in fact, many of them have multiple identity providers. So the way we integrate is obviously during the authentication process. Um, we also have mechanisms for supporting um, existing RADIUS style uh, multi-factor authentication uh, or FIDO2 type of MFA. The important part is that when the user authenticates, we're retrieving that identity context and utilizing it to make access control decisions. Um, and I think let's give a brief demo here so you can we can kind of see this in action and then we can talk a little bit about the configuration. Very good. Um, so this is the AppGate STP client right here. And I'm not signed in yet because I wanted to provide the experience. And first of all, it actually, in this part of our demo environment, I am um, gonna be authenticating against uh, Okta using SAML. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and click sign in with provider to give you the experience of this. In many cases, we actually have customers who configure this to automatically launch when the users log into their desktop and launch transparently. And the users will just use it all day long. In fact, that's how we normally work here. You know, at, at AppGate, we use this, we use our own product to get access to certain production applications that we need to do our jobs. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to go and sign in with Okta. And because it's SAML based and I haven't signed in deliberately, uh, for the demo, you can see I'm here, I'm on Okta. Uh, I'm gonna enter my cache password. And what's happened is we have configured this to require multi-factor authentication. Uh, I'm using the Okta app here on my phone. So let me click, yes, it is me. So that should be done. And if I come back here, then you can see now I've signed in. And what it's doing right now, it's connected to the controller. The controller has evaluated the, the policies and the entitlements that I get. And now I've actually connected to, in this case, seven different um, destinations, seven di different sets of gateways that are represented by those bubbles there. I have access to a bunch of different resources on the network. Some of them are represented by these icons and there's about another 50 or so that we've chosen not to display um, as icons. So we'll take a couple really quick examples of this and then we'll look at some of the, uh, the identity context that's associated with me. So in this one, um, if I click on web to server, this icon here, what will happen is this launches and gives me access to, you can see what's very clearly a, a private IP address, 10.128.0.3. It just so happens that this one I know is running in, in uh, GCP in their Iowa data center. And I only know that because <laughs> I just know how the demo environment is set up. Uh, for an end user, of course, they would have no visibility. It's just, hey, I got to do my job. I click on this icon. I go to some web app here, and then I go ahead and I do my job. I, I do my job. That connection here is actually, of course, going through this secure tunnel to the appropriate gateway, and then to this very exciting uh, PHP sysinfo page that's running on that web server in uh, in Google environment. As I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of other entitlements um, that I've got. So if I look at the list here. I can actually see, so I've got 59 different entitlements in my list that gives me access to a whole bunch of different things that are TCP based or they're UDP based or they're ICMP based, um, lots of different things. <clears throat> if we look at um, another type of protocol, this one here, for example, this one actually gives me the rights to RDP to a server, um, a Windows server in our environment. So if I click on this, a couple of things will happen. First of all, the access to this particular server is protected by MFA. So it's gonna prompt me for another MFA token. Um, and then it'll actually launch the RDP client. Um, so I'm gonna click on that and then find my application here. Enter my OTP. It says it's great, it's accepted and validated. And now what will happen is you can see it actually has now launched the Microsoft Remote Desktop application here on my, on my Mac. Um, and if I happen to remember the username and password, which I don't, I could actually connect an RDP to this Windows server. 
uh, but that wouldn't be that's not a too exciting part of the demo. Um, so that's a couple of examples of some of the entitlements and some of the access. If we look at how this context is set up, now I'm switching over to our applications administrative console. And you can see in this demo environment, we got about 20 different, 25 appliances and 20 gateways, et cetera. And there's a lot too much to show here. But if I look at um, my, um, <clears throat> my session, so you can see I'm here, I've authenticated with Okta and I've got some additional information. And I can see now the set of entitlements that I've been granted. And more importantly for our discussion is the set of claims that are attached to me. So you can see, for example, there's some system information that I'm coming from the state of Massachusetts. You can see that this is my public IP address. You can see I've got a bunch of claims here that come from the identity provider that I've got um, you know, this horrendous representation of my common name and the organizational unit, et cetera. And you can see I've got a bunch of groups that come from Okta. And this is really important, right? Because most customers and most identity teams have groups set up and assigning entitlements to users based on group membership is a key part of defining zero trust types of policies. I just want to clarify some things. What I noticed that you had some type of client running on the computer, right? What solution do you have for client-less approach? We found that um, customers and prospects ask about that a lot and that on balance, most customers are decide that it makes a lot more sense to utilize the, the agent or utilize the client for a couple of reasons. So first of all, having the presence on the desktop lets you do much more interesting things in terms of device interrogation and device posture checks. So you can very deeply look at, do I have a, a corporate managed certificate? Is my antivirus software running? Those types of things. Second, having a client on the device natively allows you to issue that single packet authorization packet and really secure an entry point to the network. Um, so we found that in most organizations, they're still utilizing corporate managed devices and it's a straightforward decision for them to say, you know what, we want to utilize this, this device on here. For customers that don't want to install a client, there's a couple of options. Um, they, could, they could run and have people access this environment through, let's say, a VDI hosted solution uh, in which the client is installed. Or there's, uh, there's a, a simple configuration where you can use something like an open source uh, web, act, web proxy uh, for web or RDP or SSH access uh, to connect that way. Because you have a client, I'm guessing you can support multiple different protocols. Can you tell us a bit more about what do you support? Can you do VoIP? Can you do password changes, printing? Yep, no, that's a great question. And that's another very powerful part of having a client as opposed to just utilizing web access. So if we look at the types of protocols that we support, and I'll very quickly um, take a look at the set of network entitlements here. And if I want to define a new one just for kicks, we configure these, we refer to these as actions. And if I wanted to add a new action, you'll see, first of all, that we support a very wide set of protocols, both TCP and UDP, ICMP, uh, as well as some other perhaps less widely used protocols like uh, AH and ESP and GRE. Um, so that allows organizations to utilize many different types of applications, whether they're your classic web-based applications, or if they're developer tools or database tools, or even legacy fat clients tools that might use some different type of protocol. Second, we support pretty uniquely, I think, uh, the ability to define down entitlements. So down entitlement is defined as a connection that goes in the reverse direction, right? So clearly if I'm here and I open up a web page, um, like I did to that PHP, you know, this is my device initiating connection up through the gateway to the target server. We you know, fundamentally um, support uh, connections that go in the opposite direction. So if you have a VoIP server, the SIP signaling protocol usually works so that the connection or the UDP traffic goes from a server down to your device. So we would support that through a UDP down, um, a UDP down uh, IP access. This also works really well for environments where we might have components of our solution deployed in, let's say a, a remote office and administrators have to access resources in that office at the same time that users in that office are accessing things up in the data center. So this bi-directional capability is really, really powerful. I have another question around the agent. Uh, how would you distribute it to multiple station or endpoints? So the, the, uh, the client is supported on all major operating systems. So for 
desktop operating systems, whether they're Windows or Mac OS or Linux, of course, it's distributed using either traditional software download from a website or it can be distributed through a company's device management system. Those are all supported. For mobile operating system, it's available in both the Google Play and the Apple Store uh, for download onto those. How this solution would work when I'm roaming or switching between networks, right? I understand that there is this one, one-time notification packet. So let's say I have a two Wi-Fi networks and I'm on the first one and I connected over SSH and I'm doing my work and then I'm switching to another Wi-Fi network. And of course, I'll have a different public IP. I'm understanding that there will be a new one-time authentication packet sent. New IP will be whitelisted for access. How the system will resume my session without me disconnecting the SSH? Yeah, in general, what happens is the device itself, the client, of course, would recognize that you, let's say, ejected your laptop from a docking station and gone from the wire network to the wireless network. So yes, it would go through the the reestablishment uh, of, the, of the connection. And the controller itself would also recognize that there was a roaming event here and it would require um, a refresh of certain attributes. It wouldn't necessarily require you to re-authenticate or to re-enter your MFA. It depends how you configure the, the policies and a lifetime of certain components of, uh, of the entitlement token. So in general, um, the customers can configure it to be pretty transparent to the user so that if they want to, the user sees uh, uh, essentially no interruption. So there would be no interruption in my SSH session. Actually, I will continue my work. I think in that situation, um, it's likely that it would it would get interrupted because you're changing networks. Obviously, if you're using something like a web app that doesn't have a long-lived connection, then it would be transparent. You showed us information about user. Can you tell us about your reporting and user behavior capabilities? What can you show to the administrators, to the management, how you can use the platform? Yes, so we have obviously um, in the administrative console, uh, a rich user interface for a system administrator to log in and to look at information about users in the system. And you can look at the connections they have, the set of entitlements, the attributes of the user, et cetera. We also support enterprise class logging. Um, we have a built-in elk stack that you can use to look at and query information about uh, users and in, in, in their access. We also have the ability to export that reliably to an external SIM um, or to use um, a mechanism like that to, uh, to integrate it with an enterprise's broader SIM system. Um, we also, of course, have logs that are recorded on user devices and the systems themselves for troubleshooting and diagnostics. I'm an accountant and uh, suddenly I'm trying to access the source code. Mm -hmm. Would you identify this event? Uh, Would you block it? Or would it go through the logs and uh, my team will have to pick it up? So your your premise was if you're you're trying to access a source code repository and you're not authorized? Like based on my job description, I'm not supposed to work with. Okay, well, so first of all, you wouldn't be able to access it because this the system operates on a pure whitelist model. You literally don't have access to any resource unless you've been explicitly granted an entitlement by it. Now, if you attempt to do that, uh, by default, that's gonna be dropped. What organizations can do is um, they can check the logs um, for failed IP access attempts. And we have the ability to set up what we call an alert entitlement. Um, so if we look at the entitlement and I were to, to look at this, we talked about the actions here. <clears throat> Most of the time, customers will be creating these allow rules, but you can also create um, you can create a block rule if you want to be a little bit more specific, like you might allow access to a whole slash 24 subnet and block certain IPs, or you can set up an alert that says, uh, that acts like a honeypot, um, so that if you've got a high value resource, you could set this and that would be very clearly logged that you could then uh, feed into a SIM and take action on it. We kind of done with the official parts of the show and going to switch to open topics. We have a couple of questions. Great. When you customer work and they have some kind of a outbound browsing inspection, doesn't matter who they use to make sure where they can access URLs, how would it work with conjunction with you two? So there's a couple of ways that we could do that. So one way is we have the capability to, um, based on a policy, assign a, a pack file to be configured on the user's device. So if customers using, let's say, a, a, a cloud-based SWIG that utilizes a pack file, 
uh, they would configure it in our system and say, for users in this group or users who uh, you know, match this profile, assign this pack file and we'd assign it using the appropriate operating system APIs. Um, and that would of course drive their web traffic through whatever proxy was configured in the pack file. That's one approach. Second approach is we have this concept of a default gateway, which is basically all traffic that isn't explicitly routed through the set of destinations that you're granted access to would get routed through this default gateway. Um, and the idea behind that is to act as a general traffic capture mechanism so that enterprises can then put their own security stacks behind that, whether it's on-premises or if they're going to set it up to something in the cloud environment. In theory, you could have two agents installed on your endpoint devices, one for upgrade and one for whatever the providers are use for outbound browsing. Uh, you could. Uh, I think the the fact that we can enforce the pack file eliminates the need to have uh, a SWIGS uh, agent installed on the device. Anything you want to share with us besides what you already shared? Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the dynamic resolving capabilities. And if you look at um, some of the entitlements that I have here, if you look at the set of entitlements I have here, We've seen some that are tied to specific IP addresses, like uh, that's not a good one here, but here's one where I can go to this specific IP address. You know, it's a fixed IP address and it's, um, it's useful, but it's not terribly exciting, right? So the interesting ones uh, are ones where we're actually utilizing dynamic resolution of the resource by the gateway itself. And in this example, you can see we're using this syntax that <clears throat> has the gateway interrogate an AWS resource or an AWS uh, VPC and look for resources that match a certain tag. And the example I'm gonna show is actually this one here. So here you see I'm granted the ability to send ICMP traffic to anything with a, a tag in AWS of mode equals QA in a, particular, um, in a particular environment. And this allows us, allows customers to dynamically move resources through let's say development life cycle uh, or to dynamically create resources in a cloud or virtualized environment and automatically have users get the right access to it without requiring any sort of administrative changes. Uh, so let's take a look at that. This is my, uh, my AWS environment here. And I've got an instance right here <clears throat> with this private IP address, this 10.2.0.1.4.176. Obviously that's a private IP address. There is no public IP address for this, this service. This one has a tag of mode equals QA. So if we think about that and we look at our entitlement, what this tells us is that I should be able to send ICMP traffic up to that particular resource. Now, obviously I'm showing you doing this manually for demonstration purposes. In production, of course, what customers will do is tie this to their DevOps type of tool chain and create or destroy instances in their virtualized environment or change metadata on it dynamically based on you know, uh, build processes or things like that. So if I come here and pull up my console, uh, and I just start pinging that service. You can see, great, I'm pinging this 10.2.0.1.4.176 and my pings are going through and everything's great. Uh, and that's again, because I have this entitlement here and the tag matches it. And if I say, let's go ahead and change that tag to something else. Um, and I say mode is prod. Um, again, what'll happen is as soon as I change that, the gateway, which is updating uh, and interrogating the, the AWS environment will recognize that uh, and change its enforcement policy so that I will no longer get this entitlement. So I'm gonna go ahead and click save here. We'll switch back here and you should see in a moment or two that my ping should stop working. And you can see that's exactly what happened. So now my pings are no longer going through because I changed that tag. And we can see that this is gonna be easily reversible. So if I go and I wanna change this back to mode equals QA, I can hit save and I'll come through here. And again, in a couple of seconds, the pings will start going through properly uh, because I've been granted that entitlement again. Um, so this is a very simple example showing ICMP traffic uh, because it's, you know, it's very clear about when it works and when it doesn't. Um, the real value that customers get out of this is when they tie this to DevOps processes or to business processes. And I'll give you another example of that. <clears throat> if I come here and I look at... Um, it is a web uh, page. So let me open up uh, this one, 10201. Um, pardon me, 10201 um, Um So what will happen is, first of all, I can't get access to it in my browser. Uh, and if I come over here, I should get a notification. Let's see. 
so I can't get access to this. Uh, and you'll see that the AppGate SDP client is notifying me, hey, 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 guy, hey, look at me. Um, so if I come over here, you'll see that there's a notification. And what the notification tells me is, hey, you're trying to access this resource, but you can't get access to it because we're actually looking and interrogating a ServiceNow instance. And there isn't an open ticket that allows you to get access to it. And if I were to log into ServiceNow and I could create a ticket and give myself access to this. Um, but what this is doing is this is showing the ability for the gateways to tie access to a business process. So now you can actually enforce at the network layer, a requirement that your users or third parties or whoever these authorized users are, go through the process of creating a ticket, coding it in the right way so that it says, you know, it, here's what needs to be fixed and here's the IP address or the host name of the server. So the troubleshooting become much easier for everyone. Yeah, exactly. And the network access becomes becomes. This nice. is a very interesting feature. I was actually wanted to ask about how you troubleshoot it and you just show it to me. Jason, we're gonna share all the information about how found white paper and the power to POC later on when we publish the episode. Thank you for coming. It was our pleasure. Thank you for having me. This was a great conversation, Dimitri and Evgeny. I really, uh, I really enjoyed it. Likewise. Thank you very much. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and join us for our next episode.